You're listening to CPG Launch Leaders, the show where we interview new product trailblazers. Get ready for inspiration and secrets from the front lines of CPG innovation. Now here are our hosts, Darcy Ramler and Alan Peretz. Welcome to CPG Launch Leaders. I'm Alan Peretz, and I'm here with my co-host, Darcy Ramler. Today we're meeting with Stuart Heflin, SVP at Quest Nutrition. Stuart's a fabulous marketer and leader who's been focused on bringing shoppers better nutrition for about a decade. That's right, Alan. Today, Stuart will be sharing his story of Quest expansion from beloved bar to multi-category lifestyle brand. How this digitally native brand success came before there was even influencer marketing and his advice on how brand leaders can pursue fearless innovation through data. Let's dive in. Stuart, it's great to have you on. We love to start each episode with the same question. Currently, what new products have caught your eye or your attention in the market? Darcy, it's great to be here. Alan, it's great to be here. Great to see you. And I'll answer that question in a, in a second, but um, I wanted to do two things first. One is congratulate you guys on this awesome podcast, CPG Launch Leaders, and just tell you how much of an honor it is for me to be on it. And I think this is only episode two, so assuming it uh, makes the cut, uh, I'll be one of the earlier <laughs> The earlier guests on this podcast, which I'm sure is going to blow up after this. So um, thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to be on here. The second thing I would say, just a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm going to talk a lot about Quest and the journey. I'm not intending to say that I did everything or I'm the only one that's worked on this. Like I'm speaking on behalf of the Quest team, both past and present. Now to your question. Uh, what kind of products have I seen that have been impressive? And you know, on this one, I'm going to be shamelessly self-promotional. We, we, we like shameless. It's okay. I'm really <laughs> excited about these Quest cheese crackers. <laughs> these are an amazing snack. You know, if if you like, I'm not going to say what brand it looks like this, but these are a, a better for you version in a sense that 10 grams of protein and only five gram net carbs per serving. So this is really exciting. These are doing very well. Another one, overly self-promotional. We've had a lot of success <laughs> with our protein chips, our tortilla style protein chips, and we just launched this flavor, the hot and spicy. So for all you heat heads out there, this one is for you. And we're getting a lot of great consumer reaction to these and, and folks are loving them. So those are a couple of products I'm really excited about. Is it a salsa meats tortilla chip? <laughs> it's a little bit more spicier than that. We're like hot. Okay. It's actually really spicy. I'm a hothead myself, right? I actually eat very, very spicy food. I mean, I always hear people say stuff like you go to a restaurant and they're like, oh, this is spicy. And I'm like, I don't believe it. And most of the time it isn't, right? So we actually tried to make these spicy. I would say they are something that a mainstream person could really enjoy. It's not to the point where it's going to, uh, you know, I can't finish the bag or something like that, but it's right on that edge. So we wanted to walk right on that line. And I think we achieved that with this product. Well, that's what I was going to say, Stuart. You and I uh, worked in the same building years and years and years ago. And I remember two things about you. One, you're an amazing marketer and you've proven that already in this in this call. And number two, you and I were the only only people who could eat the hottest <laughs> yes, wings, right. if you if you recall. <laughs> you and I do have we share that. And uh there's something that's kind of never gone away, actually. Uh, I really just love and enjoy spicy stuff. A little bit of how I know if a meal is good if I start sweating a little bit, if little beads of sweat start coming. Okay, this is good. I was gonna say you gotta dab the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk Quest. When did Quest decide to expand into new categories beyond bars and how far back does that go? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think if you look back over the history, the desire to expand into categories outside of bars was always there. Founders who, who ran the, this company for the early part of the history of the brand, they always had intentions of doing other things outside of bars. And then they even attempted in some cases to do so. And they didn't have a failure of imagination of types of products that they could launch. I think where they fell short a little bit is they didn't have the know-how of how to take a really good idea. And then how do you scale that? How do you make that profitable? How do you make that a real product that you can sell over time and repeatedly have the same quality? I think really where a dream became a reality is when they decided to bring in uh, Dave Ritterbush, who was the CEO 
probably around 2017. And he brought his, and he's actually a, a very good mentor of mine, a friend of mine. He was the one that came in and really took these dreams and then put the wherewithal to make it reality, right? By bringing in uh, really kind of professional marketers. I came in really focused on this dream of innovation. That really was my title. That was the whole point of me coming here was to help us expand. And uh, both in terms of building out the pipeline, as well as the infrastructure, like the stage gate system, et cetera. How do we actually commercialize these products and make sure that they are viable products as well as profitable in the marketplace? Can you take us through a little bit of your process, how you decided to go after which categories and so forth? It goes back to the mission of the brand and the mission of the company. And at that time, the mission of the company was we are on a mission to make the foods you crave work for you and not against you. And so if you think about it, what are all the types of foods you crave? You could just kind of walk around the grocery store. You see all the, the different candies and baked goods. and Salty, sweet. You know, stuff, that people would, <laughs> stuff that people would call junk food, right? Yeah. And, and for people who have made a lifestyle choice that they have to avoid carbs, they have to have lower sugar, looking to get higher protein, which is essential in a diet, Right they don't have the opportunity to eat all of those foods. And so it's not it's not very difficult to see how you can look at all these products out here and say, how can I make that? Can I, what we like to say at Quest is flip the macros upside down. So you take something that is high sugar, high carb, low protein, then it becomes high protein, high fiber, low sugar, low carb, flip those upside down. And we've really been flipping the macros upside down on products that people love, uh, for many years now and have had a lot of success by doing it. Great. So you knew a whole lot about the bar shopper coming into this as a company. Was the bar shopper the shopper you were going after with these new products or was it a different shopper? Yeah, yeah I think, you know, when we started off this brand with, I would say, the main customer or consumer, some we would call the Mr. Olympia archetype, right? And it's everything you would expect. It's someone that's in the gym and it's someone that works out a lot. We've always had ambitions of expanding our consumer base. One of the things that's interesting to know, and sometimes people are shocked when I share this about Quest, our brand consumer is predominantly female. Now, we, we're not a feminine brand at all, but we have a heavy appeal to females. I'm talking on a level of 60, 40, 70, 30. So we started there, but the intention was always to say, this brand has a huge promise and it can appeal to a lot of people and meet people on their quest, whatever that quest may be. You see now that our consumer is a working professional. They are what we call a millennial minded striver. They tend to be higher income. Um, they tend to be higher education. And they're someone who eats and snacks with intentionality and in a way that kind of lines up with their quest and whatever they're trying to do in life. So it's far, far outside of sort of that initial bar kind of gym customer. Not that those are the folks who made our brand and we love them and we never want to do anything to push them away. But we think we can reach them as well as expand our horizons and, and talk to a, a much broader set of consumers. Absolutely. And as you entered in these huge categories where you have established players as your competition, can you expand a little bit more on what your approach and strategy was behind that? It's actually interesting because you talk about competition and in a lot of ways, our success is we didn't have competition, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? If you think about some of these categories we've expanded into, uh, chips is a great example, right? These chips, there's not a chip out there like this, right? This mm -hmm. is, you know, 19 grams of protein, four grams of net carbs. It's not a like dried meat or jerky type of chip. It's, you know, it's not something that is claiming to be healthy. It's actually constructed of protein and fiber, mm -hmm. but it tastes like a chip. So if you look at that market, I would argue that there's not really a lot of competition. Now there's people who, who are trying now to emulate us and uh, good luck with that to them. Uh, I wish them the best. Um, <laughs> but the way that we built this brand out is we found these products that very, very difficult technology wise to, to produce. And therefore we haven't had a ton of which we would call competition. Obviously, we have mainstream competition, but in this uh, sphere of high protein, low carb, not a ton of folks were in that. And I think that's one of the reasons, if you look at this category, 
I would say the only brand that legitimately is a lifestyle brand. There's a lot of brands in this category and some well-known brands, but if you think about it, they're really more products, right? Name the brand out there that has bars, cookies, confections, salty snacks, you know, all of those businesses thriving. It's really a, a very uncommon thing to see in this category. And I think it's one of the things that's a, p- a part of the DNA of this brand. We always used to say, like, we zig when everybody else zags. And that's kind of how we got here. You found that white space and then capitalized on it. Yes, right. So you're going into all these categories. You're doing new packaging. How do you make sure that your brand stays together and you don't start to lose, uh, lose the core of the brand and the equity? Yeah, it's it's tough. <laughs> so I, I don't want to sit here and say that I have all of the answers. We do a lot of work as we expand because household penetration is core for us. And obviously the innovation and these new platforms that we've launched make it easier for everyday people to become Questies. So that's something we have to continue to do. Like uh, Innovation is the lifeblood of this brand and will continue to be. But one of the things that's underpinned the success of this brand, if you look at our recent results, uh, going back now a couple of years, we've looked at our core business, which we look at as our bars. If that's growing, then everything else we build on top of that becomes incremental. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to successfully do that. And it it becomes harder and harder. You can't necessarily divide up media dollars and go spin on every single thing. So what we have to really trust is that we are able to communicate our brand promise in total. And that that applies to all of the uh, the platforms that we launch and these wonderful platforms that consumers love. And we do a lot, I would say, in the lower funnel tactics as far as focusing on specific products and targeting those and in places like digital and social media and, you know, some of our digital video and, and programmatic kind of buys that we do within Top of funnel stuff on TV is much more of a holistic brand message. And that that seems to be working for us. So so most of your advertising is portfolio or or individual item? Most of our advertising, I would say, is is portfolio, but it's it's told at this time that the advertising campaign that we're using, it's told through the story of products. So but it it, it meant, mm-hmm. it's kind of meant to halo to the whole brand. So we're trying to walk this line of doing both. We focus our advertising a lot on our key products. So you'll, you'll see a lot of ads out there for bars, uh, which we've recently made an, an update to a, a formula uh, improvement. So our, our bars are better, salter and yummier than ever. And that's been really supercharging our, our business. But we also talk a lot about salty snacks in our advertising. And we kind of use those products as examples of the types of products that we that we carry in the upper funnel tactics. And then, as I said, once, once we get into more lower funnel digital types of executions, we can be a lot more focused on particular segments. As you entered into some of these snack categories, were there any shopper barriers that you guys stumbled across that you found surprising or didn't have the foresight to? I think some of the barriers that we see from a consumer perspective weren't as big, right? Like we, mm-hmm. we had, we built up a pretty good following of our bars and, you know, that's probably our most maniacal devoted fans and consumers, right? And we always have sort of a captive audience that's willing to, okay, they, they made this bar. Can they make this, you know, can they make this cheese cracker? Can they make this cookie, right? I think you're being modest with a captive audience. You guys have a following, like a true cult around <laughs> you guys, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, we, we call the Questies the Quest Squad. Yeah, They're always looking for what we're coming out with next. Over time, we built up a reputation that, I've heard people say things like Quest doesn't miss. Like if Quest launches something, you know it's legit. That's their words, not mine. So <laughs> I think actually a lot of the barriers were more on the retail side, right? Okay. Getting the retailers to believe in these products. And one of the things that this brand benefited from greatly in its early days is the presence that we had in the specialty channel. So if you think about these retailers like Vitamin Shop in GNC and a lot of the mom and pop specialty stores that that, that focus on supplements and even online, direct to consumer, et cetera. Because those retailers partnered with us early on and believed in this brand, it allowed us to have a proof of concept. And once we started to build this brand out, it became a little bit easier to go to more mainstream retail, the more food, drug, mass retailers of the world. 
And so we benefited greatly from having that sort of early start in the smaller channels, which are more focused on this particular type of product to have that one-to-one relationship with the consumer that can build your brand and build credibility in this space. And that actually helped us with a lot of the challenge of now, you know, expanding into these larger retailers. Hi, Jesse. What brings you to the airport? Mike, I'm off to the headquarters to share an update on the big launch. Oh, I've heard it's selling really well. Care to share your secret? Well, just between us, it's all thanks to Bold Labs. Their exclusive digital test market research allows you to optimize your product, marketing, and pricing before the big launch. That sounds fantastic. How can I learn more? Just visit www.boldlabs.com. It's all right there. This is the final call for flight 723 to Chicago. Looks like we'd better go. Thanks for the tip, Jesse. See you soon, Mike. And remember, Bold Labs is ready to help your product soar. So people knew you as a bar. Did being a bar cause any shopper resistance as you moved into other categories? Did the shopper wonder if you could make that move or was it pretty natural? No, I I mean, I think the shoppers, they just demand that it's a product that that meets their needs and, and importantly tastes good. I think especially with new folks coming into the category who haven't tried some of our bars, there's a believability barrier. If I show you these chips and I say man, 19 grams of protein, four grams, of, how good can that really be? If you talk to people who shop the category, not necessarily our brand, but they, they'll say things like protein products are chalky, protein products, they have an aftertaste. They do some of, some of these things. We look at it as our goal and our and our mission in this in this space to show people that you can make a really good product that actually tastes good. Our repeat rate on a brand is above 50%. So once people try this, they're going to come back. We've been able to break those barriers down and, 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 you know, to the earlier comment of that consumer, like Quest doesn't miss. So if they came out with it, it must be legit. We might not be the first ones, but we're the best ones when we come out with something like that. As you expanded into new categories, was there a marketing campaign or toolkit or, or set of tactics that you found to be really successful? I would say we have a secret weapon here at Quest and at Simply Good Foods. And that is we have an internal one is we are what we call a digitally native brand. That's what I call it, a digitally native brand. We're a brand that came up entrepreneurial, scrappy, didn't have TV budgets, didn't have money to run streaming or or things like that. And and this is a, a group of folks who early on mastered social media. We were doing influencer campaigns before it really was a buzzword. So we kind of built an apparatus to be able to tell people um, the news on Quest over time. And then the thing I was going to say, our secret weapon, we actually have a in-house creative team that I work with. And they're actually sitting right upstairs um, and they really know this brand in and out. So for every single thing we launch, we have a campaign we, it's really insight driven and we can shoot it inside. We can do all, all, all kinds of content. We put out so much content. We have almost a million followers on Instagram. And that might not sound like a ton, but if you look at food brands, how many folks are following on social media? It's nowhere near that, right? So for every single campaign that we've had, every product we've launched, I feel like we've had amazing content produced, been able to put the word out in social media and particularly early on with influencers, both paid and unpaid influencers as well. But obviously, as the years have gone on and, and we've you know been able to, to invest more in marketing, we have started to, to really go on those upper funnel channels like TV, linear TV, cable, broadcast, streaming is big for us. The campaign I was telling you about, Alan, earlier, what we call our way bigger campaign, which is this idea that it's way bigger than a, a bar, it's a quest, right? That's that's really the message that we put out there and it kind of holistically covers this brand from all the testing we've done and research we've done. We know that that's resonating with consumers. All that in-house capability must give you a, a big speed advantage. Oh, it's absolutely a huge advantage. We can move fast and not only fast, the just sheer amount of content we can put out. And I know you said when you started there, you know, you guys were able to find the white space and really capitalize on that. 
But as you continue to grow as a brand and the categories are getting more competitive and more competitive, as we all know, up and coming trends and health is on the focus of most consumers' minds. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys differentiate to your consumers or your retailers and and what that looks like? The best innovations always are comprised of two things. One being a strong consumer insight or sort of understanding of what's happening, right? An unmet need that we talked about. But the other side of that is for it to really work, you have to have a strong technical insight or technical right to succeed in that space. And I think that combination of things is really where it's hard for some competitors to to compete with us. I'm not going to get too deep into our technical process and things like that, but Our R&D team, led by Jeremy Ivey, um, is best in class. And uh, our ability to understand protein and how to work with it and how to create these products. You know, again, a lot of people have ideas of things they want to launch or would it be cool if we could do this? Would it be cool? Can you make it shelf stable? Can you make it taste good? Can you make it profitably? Can you scale it? That's where I would put uh, the money on us. And and that's where it's it's been uh, really successful for us. Great. So changing gears a bit, making tough decisions is is something that we all have to do. What's one of the hardest ones you've had to make being at Quest? We actually have made some decisions that, that are, are tough. Like I would say we recently licensed our pizza business. It's a great business for us. It really proves how how far this brand can stretch and how this can, if there's anything that shows this brand isn't a, just a bar brand, right? You can make a pizza and it's successful. <laughs> but at the same time, when we look at where we play and and where the scale is and, and where we have real expertise, that was a decision that, that we made. We love that product so much and we love to work on it. And, and there's a lot of passion behind it, but it was the right thing to do for our organization to, uh, to let a partner Uh, handle that one. You know, they've been doing a great job with that business. And so as we kind of expand onto this and talk about innovation and what you guys have been doing at Quest, what has been one of the number one surprises that you've come across venturing into new categories and expanding a brand? Is there any aha moments that you've had that said, I did not see that coming? I'll stick with pizza for that one, actually. We decided to launch a pizza and we had this dream uh, and the team before me had, had kind of started it as well. But we were just trying to find a retailer to try this with us, right? Just just give us a test market and see if it, if it works. And we found a really strategic retailer that they honestly had more of a vision for this product than even we did. And so we were like trying to get like 500 stores. They were like, no, how about we just go right out and put it in all stores? And keep in mind, we had no expertise about frozen, how to make a pizza, about frozen supply chains, about any of this stuff. We were just learning as we go. I mean, we got out here and and Darcy, like, we couldn't make enough pizzas. The thing was selling like crazy. We couldn't, we didn't know how to to ship it. We didn't understand how to, how to work with it, right? So it kind of sounds crazy today that, that we did that. But the one thing I do admire about this company and this brand, um, that, and it's something that's firmly in the DNA, is we aren't afraid to fail. We built the plane as we were flying. You're not always going to have all the right expertise and all the right data and all the right information. You have to be willing a little bit to trust yourself, trust your organization, trust the team that they will learn fast and adapt and be agile and be nimble. We definitely went through a lot of tough times on that. You know, we were, a lot of days we were in a conference room on a whiteboard, like, how can we get another pizza? How can we do this? How can we do that? How can we ship this? How can we get some raw ingredients in to the manufacturing facility? Like, it was, it was a, a whole thing. But one of those experiences that I wouldn't trade for the world, right, as far as what, what we learned from it. So you've been involved with innovation for, for a while. How, how is it changing today? I've been doing innovation probably been like 10 years since I had a job that didn't involve innovation. What's different right now to me is is the ability to have so much data and so much insight and to be able to fail fast and fail cheap on stuff. And honestly, Alan, you and Darcy, the stuff you guys are doing with Bold right now, I mean, you guys are on the forefront of, of this kind of pioneering space, what you guys are doing with these virtual test markets. 
and things like that. It, it's a lot easier to know if something's a good idea or not and know faster and be able to find that out cheaper. But what's the same? It's still hard. There's still no guarantees. There's still uh, innovation is messy. You know, it's it's not a straight line. It's it's sort of one of these things and it becomes iterative and you're trying to figure it out. Right. And you got to have to be some some organization that's comfortable with that ambiguity and comfortable sort of betting on yourself that at some point we'll figure this out, especially if you want to keep speed to market at the forefront, which we do. We really believe in it's better to be fast and perfect. If I could tell you exactly what was going to work every single time, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys, at least not from this office. I'm going to be on my, my beach house somewhere. I'm taking your uh, private you plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, there's no guarantee. But today I do think you can get a little bit better idea and at least you can learn easier and cheaper. Well, there has to be a beauty to being a part of an organization that is has such a disruptive point of view in innovation where it is, you don't have to be perfect. We want to move fast. You know, you want to, to be able to do that. But based on kind of what you said, I know you said, don't be afraid to fail, which I love. Is there any other advice that you'd give to CPG leaders that work in innovation or in product launch? Yeah, well, I, well, first of all, like all the people who are working on launches, if they're in my space, I, I wish them all the worst of luck. I hope they <laughs> fail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but anyone outside, how about outside the competition? <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, simplicity is key, right? I think one thing I've learned from successful launches that we've had is it, it's simple. The, the idea is simple. The concept is simple. And when you try to make things complex, that's where issues come into play. You know, as a PNG guy, Alan, you know, you remember when we went to uh, ABM College, and they always made us have the PNG one pager, right? The PNG one pager, which I don't use much, but the concept of it made a ton of sense, right? Which is, if I can't put an idea on one page, I probably don't understand the idea. Like, I probably can't. I don't have the simplest articulation of what that thing is, and I need to go do my homework. I need to go back to figure that out, right? And I think. When you get to something concept, if you think about a Quest bar, athlete worthy nutrition, it tastes good. That's the concept. Bang. Right. That's why this brand works. When you start to get to, oh, you know, it's this and it's that, and it also has this bell and whistle, and it also does this thing, and, and, and there's 14 RTBs, and there's you probably go into a space where this isn't gonna work. Like you're talking to yourself. The consumer, it has to be very clear what you're trying to do for these things to work. So I know in, a, in the, the process of innovation, right, there's a lot of different data. There's a lot of different at, you know, things that come into play in different perspectives and points of view and, and what's going on in the marketplace. But at some point, you have to be able to distill that down to something simple for it to work. Great. Without violating any, any kind of confidentiality, can you tell us a bit about what you're working on today? Yeah, I mean, I think, a lot of what we talked about today, you can expect more of the same, right? We are, I would say, our number one focus is household penetration. Uh, we've been growing household penetration very rapidly. And that really comes from two, two kind of areas. One is we want to have impactful communication, talking to our prospective Questies, and really convert more and more of those households to become Questies. Um, so we're going to stay focused on that. And we have a very good track record of innovation. As I said, innovation is the thing that makes it easier for everyday people to become Questies. And so all these products I showed you today, like the cheese crackers, hot spicy protein chips, like there's going to be a lot more of that stuff coming. Obviously, I can't tell you what, but we're working very hard to create this, this lifestyle brand that really works for so many people and it helps people on their quest, whatever that quest may be. Um, so that's what I'm up to. And that's, that's what we're focused on every day. Amazing. Lots of more awesome products to come. <laughs> yeah. Just wait and see, just wait. And see. <laughs> well, Stuart, thank you so much for sharing your story and the journey of quest category expansion from bar to a lifestyle brand. Stories like yours remind us to keep innovating, stay inspired, and let's continue to redefine the world of CPG innovation. 
Darcy Allen is a pleasure. Again, congratulations uh, on this podcast and congratulations on everything you guys are doing at Bold. And um, can't wait to talk to you guys again soon. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. You've been listening to CPG Launch Leaders, a show from Bold Strategies Incorporated. Don't miss the next thrilling launch story. Follow the podcast on your podcast player now. Please give us a rating, leave a comment, and share episodes with your friends. Until next time. Thank you.